According to a new poll, 48% of Americans do not believe that Joe Biden is mentally sound enough to effectively serve as president, which raises a very important question. What are 52% of Americans thinking? Are they not paying any attention? Are they blind? Are they deaf? Are they just plain stupid? Well, the joke's on us because even though half the country believes that Joe Biden is basically a vegetable, he and his associates will continue to run the show. There's not nothing that we can do about it. There actually are some key Republicans who are doing the right things, but time is running out. I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. Welcome back to the show. My favorite comment yesterday is from Zachary, who said he must have known what I was going to talk about today because he wrote, I'm not sure why everyone is taking orders from a person who is just above vegetable status. <laughs> yes, I think a lot of people are thinking that. I actually did not even see that comment by the time I wrote my show, but a lot of people are thinking it. About half the country is thinking it. And, and I think there is an answer to that, by the way, which is that Biden and his associates and the broader liberal regime is just convincing everyone that their rule is inevitable, that there's no choice, that even if a vegetable is at the top of the heap, their rule, their priorities are what is going to happen. You know, it, it just, it, it's enough to give you a headache. It's enough to make you want some relief, which is why I would check out Relief Band. If you regularly suffer from car sickness or nausea, you have got to check out Relief Band. Relief Band is the number one FDA cleared anti-nausea wristband that has been clinically proven to quickly relieve and effectively prevent nausea and vomiting that's associated with motion sickness, anxiety, uh, uh, chemotherapy, morning sickness, hangovers, I mean a whole variety. It's an amazing product. The way that it works, because I was a little skeptical of it, it stimulates a nerve in your wrist that travels to the part of the brain that controls nausea, and then it blocks the signal that your brain is sending to your stomach telling you to feel sick. So it's 100% drug-free. It's non-drowsy. It's all-natural, long-lasting relief with zero side effects. You may have tried some cheap imitator in the past. You know, you pick up something for 10 or 15 bucks at the drugstore. It doesn't work. This is not that. This is number one, FDA cleared, clinically proven to work. As the world opens back up, do not let fear of nausea keep you on the sidelines. Right now, Relief Band has an exclusive offer just for Michael Knowles listeners. If you go to reliefband.com, use promo code Knowles, you will get 20% off. You will also get free shipping. You will also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. That is R-E-L-I-E-F-B-A-N-D.com. Promo code Knowles for 20% off plus free shipping. So this poll, this is a Fox News poll, but it, I have no reason to think that it's not a reliable poll. Uh, 49% of Americans think that Biden has the mental soundness to serve. 48% say he does not. And I don't know, I guess 3% of Americans were out making a sandwich or something. They weren't paying attention to this. Uh, this is really bad news for Biden, not just because half the country thinks he's a vegetable, but because the numbers are getting worse for him. So they were asked this question uh, uh, weeks before, and 49% again said, yes, he's fit to serve. But 40, 45%, only 45% said, no, he's not mentally fit enough to serve. Now that number has jumped up to 48. Number very likely will go higher. The way that the liberal establishment is working around Joe Biden's obvious decline and unfitness is not that they're defending Biden. You'll notice they're not really defending Biden as much anymore. Not that they're promoting Kamala Harris. She's extremely unlikable, so they're not, they're not trying that either. What they are doing is they are trying to present the Biden rule, and Biden is just a stand-in for the broader liberal rule, as inevitable. So this is from the AP. This is the Associated Press. An AP reporter, John Lemire, tweets out, quote, the Pentagon admitted that its errant drone strike or admitted its errant drone strike, the one that killed 10 people, including seven kids. COVID boosters did not get full approval. France recalled its ambassador. The punishing headlines all within an hour underscored the perils for a president from uncontrollable events that can define a term. Uncontrollable events. Uh, these, these all seem very controllable to me. The, the drone strike that did not kill a terrorist, but instead killed an aid worker and two adult members of his family and seven kids was not uncontrollable. It didn't just fall out of the sky on a meteor. 
or a meteorite, it, it, someone pushed the button and someone gave the order and someone authorized the military to give this order. That was controllable. COVID boosters did not get full approval. This also was controllable. The messaging confusion on coronavirus was extremely controllable. Going all the way back to the masks don't work. Yes, the masks work. We're not going to get a vaccine. We did get a vaccine. The vaccine's very effective, but actually the vaccine's not effective enough, so you need a booster. The, the vaccine is extremely safe, but actually the vaccine's not safe enough to get approval for the booster. All of that was controllable if you didn't lie and mislead people and get out ahead of your story. And then France recalling its ambassador. France recalled its ambassador because the United States struck a deal with the United Kingdom and Australia and excluded France from the deal to counter the rise of China. If we had just involved France in that decision or made some way to mitigate the fallout when we didn't include France in that decision, that would have been controllable too. But the liberal regime is incompetent sometimes and malicious at other times. And now they're getting pushback for that. And now they're trying to pretend that it's, it's uncontrollable. It, it is very controllable. By the way, worth pointing out, that's from the Associated Press. When you look at those ridiculous charts of the reliable news sites, and these are not reliable down at the bottom of the pyramid, but the ones at the top are much more reliable. AP is at the very tippy top, and the AP is shilling for the regime. Now, getting to the, the very first thing they point out here, the Pentagon's drone strike, Joe Biden, he doesn't come out and address any of this. He probably can't, but his spokesman does. Jen Psaki comes out, and in true Biden fashion, makes the drone strike that killed 10 people, including seven kids, entirely about him. Following up on the drone strike uh, last week that the Pentagon now admits was a tragic mistake, um, what was the president's response when he learned about that? Well, the president was briefed um, on Friday morning uh, about the, uh, the um, report that was going to be uh, released and put out. I would say first the president's uh, view and all of our view is that the loss of any civilian life is a tragedy, uh, as, was, uh, as was made clear in the comments by the Secretary of Defense, uh, by uh, General McKenzie. Uh, this was done in error, uh, and clearly uh, the investigation that will continue is something the president broadly supports. So as a human being, uh, as a president, as somebody who has uh, overseen loss in a variety of uh, scenarios, both as a leader and personally, it is a, it, his reaction is it's a tragedy, uh, and every loss is a tragedy, and he supports the efforts to the effort to move this forward as quickly as possible and to have a thorough investigation. How dare you? How dare you ask Joe Biden why he droned that family with seven kids? How dare he? He has experienced loss too. Don't. Maybe we could have a little sympathy or a little empathy here, okay? Not for the family that was zapped out of this from the sky, but but for Joe Biden because he's experienced loss. He does this a lot. And the thing is, Joe Biden actually has experienced loss, right? His wife was killed in a car crash and his son died of cancer. And it's he, the man has actually had a difficult life. And, you know, one would have a great deal of sympathy for him. Except that he trots this out all the time. He exploits these deaths and losses for political gain. And it's, it's unseemly. Maybe he's doing it out of a place of genuine brokenness and, and sorrow, and it could be. Maybe he's doing this for political effect. He did, because the, the reason I think it's the latter is because his wife was killed by a driver. The driver, you know, there were a lot of tests done. There was an investigation. The driver just had an accident. It's not like he was drunk. It's not like he was on drugs. It was just a tragic accident. And Joe Biden acknowledged this, and it really haunted the guy his whole life. Then the minute the guy died, Joe Biden started saying out of nowhere that he was drunk, started smearing him as drunk on the campaign trail. And it was just a vicious lie about the guy. It really hurt his family. It was, it was obviously not true. So I, I think it was the latter. And this is typical of, of Joe Biden. So I, I don't, th he's, it, it just shows you the desperation on his part for any sort of sympathy whatsoever, because he's in a really bad spot politically. But the regime broadly is not in a bad spot. They are still pretty firmly entrenched in power. Now, the question is, in 2024, who replaces Joe Biden? If the Republicans do win, who is the president going to be? There is a new poll just came out. Uh, nearly 58% of Republicans, nearly 6 in 10, would nominate Donald Trump again. Trump is absolutely dominating 
the Republican presidential field. Number two, this was a little surprising to me, Mike Pence. Mike Pence comes in second with 13%. Ron DeSantis comes in third with only 9%. We're talking about Ron DeSantis as though he's the Republican nominee. He's only got 9% support. Uh, Rubio and Nikki Haley both have about 3%. Now the question shifts when you take Trump out of the field. So if Trump is not in the field, the numbers are very different. Pence comes in on top with 32% support. Ron DeSantis with 20% support. Ted Cruz with 14% support. The rest, I think, are, you know, a little, little bit too low to care about right now. So what does this mean? It means, one, Donald Trump is still considered to be the strongest Republican. He's the one who is punching back against not just the liberal establishment, but his own establishment, which is a pretty amazing thing that the Republicans still support him. Six out of 10 Republicans still support him. But I think it also shows you that the people who are ready to just crown Ron DeSantis right now, DeSantis is doing a great job. I don't mean to speak ill of what he's doing in Florida, but the people who are willing to crown him, I think are, are getting ahead of themselves. There's still a long way to go. One last poll before we get to why the polls don't mean anything at all. Right now in Virginia, there's a, a race that seemed competitive. It used to seem competitive. Now it seems less competitive. This is a Terry McAuliffe, the Democrat versus Glenn Youngkin. Uh, there was a poll done by the L. Douglas Wilder School of Government and Public Affairs at Virginia Commonwealth University. 43% of likely voters are supporting McAuliffe. That's nine points higher than the 34% who support Youngkin. Th this means that McAuliffe is increasing his lead over Youngkin. I pointed this out after the debate where the Republican Glenn Youngkin came out. He was, he was asked about the Texas abortion law and he criticized the Texas abortion law and he tried to pretend that he was going to be a more moderate, squishy type of guy. I said that was a bad answer because you didn't pick up any lib votes, but you irritated a lot of conservatives who may not, not be motivated to vote for you now, especially in a state that people consider Democrat. Uh, that would seem to be playing out right now. Do not squish. Squishing is a bad idea. But the thing is, despite all of these polls, that's only one aspect of the political problem for Republicans. The broader one is that the liberal establishment has tightened its grip on power and very likely will not, will not let us win in the future. When you want to protect yourself against all these sorts of things and against burglars and against in-laws, I would recommend you check out Ring. Sometimes I go on the road. Sometimes I visit different colleges and speak at different places like I'm doing right now. And when I am on the road, I can have peace of mind because of a ring alarm. The ring alarm security system just gives you so much ease. You all know about the d video doorbells where you can see and speak to whoever is at your door, whether it's the delivery guy or the pizza guy or your mother-in-law, and you can calibrate your response accordingly. All right. But you can also keep an eye on every corner of your home outdoors, indoors, and you can control that all from a very simple app. It's great. It just makes me feel good to know that sweet little Elisa and cute little baby June are safe, whether I'm in the house, whether I am outside of the house. Makes a great housewarming gift because it's top tier technology and not very expensive, so you get good credit for a good gift. You won't have to spend a lot. Protect your home anytime from anywhere with Ring Alarm. Go to ring.com slash Knowles for a special offer on a Ring Alarm security kit today. Build the system that's right for your home. Have it up and running in minutes. That is ring.com slash Knowles, ring.com slash Knowles. We all talk about the horse race and, well, this candidate said this and this candidate did this and, well, this will appeal to voters and this will appeal to the suburban women and this will, and you're, you're kind of missing the broader point here on how our elections are conducted, which is that there are other forces at play beyond public opinion. You saw this with some of the election rules that were passed or just implemented without being legal in 2020. The libs putting their thumb on the scales of the election saying, oh, okay, yeah, well, you can campaign all you want, but we're going to institute widespread mail-in ballots without any voter ID. We're going to institute motor voter laws. We're going to institute ballot harvesting. We're going to continue counting the votes for days and days and weeks and weeks. Why are we doing that? I don't know. We're going, we're going to do this, that, and the other thing to tilt the election in our favor. And even that, the, the election, the specific election fraud stuff, even that is just one aspect. There's another aspect, which is that the people who control the flow of information, the people who control the public square, are not going to allow Republicans too much freedom to make their case. 
There's a candidate right now for governor of Michigan, Garrett Soldano. He's a primary candidate to be the next governor. He has been permanently blacklisted from YouTube. YouTube owned by Google. This is according to reports. So this guy's running for governor of Michigan, but he can't present his message on the largest video platform in the world. He can't run ads on the largest video platform in the world owned by the most powerful company basically ever in the history of the world that has more information on you and can not only predict your behavior, but impel your behavior in a way that no other company has ever been able to do. A company that has extremely close ties to the federal government, that has taken money from the federal government, that gives information to the federal government, that shares a lot of employees with the federal government. They are now saying, no, that Republican, nope, poof, and he's gone. Google did this a little while ago to Rand Paul. Rand Paul, sitting United States Senator, YouTube censored a video of him speaking on the floor of the Senate. We think that our government is ruled by the executive in the White House and the judges at the Supreme Court and the House members in the lower chamber and the senators in the upper chamber of the legislature. And that's just not true. If that were true, That would be the place with the greatest political breadth, the greatest freedom of speech and freedom of whatever. But it's not because then there's Google and Google can decide if it likes what people are saying on the floor of the Senate, it will permit that to be broadcast into the public square. And if it doesn't, you know, if it's Rand Paul saying something, then they're just going to disappear it and you're not going to see it. And that's that. Poof. See ya. In both of these cases, by the way, it's because these gentlemen said things that contradicted the liberal regime's COVID policies. The COVID policies, of course, are now not just one aspect of their broader agenda. It is the agenda. The COVID lockdowns are everything. It, it, the, co- the COVID regulations now will regulate the way that we travel, the way we go to school, the way we go to work, the way we buy things, the way we speak, the way we dress, the way we have our medical care, the way we relate our medical information, it, it touches everything, it touches everything in the whole country. And so if a Republican senator or a governor candidate, gubernatorial candidate, in any way criticize the way that the liberal regime is governing everything, well, the regime might just say, poof, you're gone. This is uh, something that the the left has been working on for a long time. This is a strategy that the left has been honing and perfecting for the better part of a hundred years through the, certainly the progressivism of Woodrow Wilson, then it gets implemented by FDR. But I think you see it really start to hit its stride with global warming. Global warming has, has all of the same characteristics that we're seeing with the COVID regulations. The time is running out. We have to suspend the normal way our society runs. You have to give us a ton more power. You have to let us regulate every aspect of your life. It's urgent. You'll die if we don't. It's for public health. If you question us, you're a murderer. It's all all the same stuff. They've been more effective with COVID because people are more afraid of germs than they are of the sun monster, but it's the exact same strategy. And so uh, Joe Biden now, speaking at the United Nations, doesn't want to put all of his eggs in the COVID basket. He also wants to put some of them in the sun monster basket. This year has also brought widespread death and devastation from the borderless climate crisis. The extreme weather events that we have seen in every part of the world, and you all know it and feel it, represent what the Secretary General has rightly called code red for humanity. And the scientists and experts are telling us that we're fast approaching a point of no return in a literal sense. To keep within our reach the vital goal of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, every nation needs to bring their highest possible ambitions to the table when we meet in Glasgow for COP26. The point of no return in the literal sense, not the figurative sense, in the literal sense. And of course, he is describing the, the figurative sense. He doesn't mean that we're getting, it's not, we're not getting to some geographic location where you can't turn around anymore. But again, Joe Biden, not, not a whole lot going on between the ears. My question is, when do we get to that point? When do we get to the point of no return? That's the fear 
We're, it's a code red. We're so we're now so close to a point where any of our efforts to mitigate global warming will do nothing. They'll be to no avail if we get to this point of no return. So we've got to do everything now. When's the point? Tell me when. Give me a date for the point. Because then once we get to that point, I don't want to hear it anymore. I don't want to hear about how we have to do this and we have to. You just told me it's the point of no return. So let's live it up, buddy. Now, he's not going to give you a date. And if he does give you a date, he's going to downplay that date and everyone's going to forget about that date because they've given us that date before. They've been doing this for decades. 1989, Noel Brown, environmentalist who was uh, associated with the United Nations, said that entire nations could be wiped off the face of the earth by rising sea levels if global warming is not reversed by the year 2000. Okay, so at least that's a specific time, right? He says in 1989, if in 11 years we have not reversed global warming, entire nations are going to be wiped off the earth. Year 2000 came. I guess we didn't reverse global warming. We're still talking about it. So, okay, it's over. It's over. We've reached the point of no return. So shut up about it. But they don't shut up about it. The year 2000, David Viner, British climate scientist, says, children just aren't going to know what snow is. We're really going to get caught out. Snow will probably cause chaos in 20 years' time because people aren't going to know what it is. Here's just one headline from uh, from 2018, you know, 18 years in. London has been hit by a wall of snow and a huge blizzard as the UK is rocked by bone-chilling temperatures, ice, and wintry weather from the beast from the east. It goes on. So people, I think children still know what snow is. 20 years on, it's all it's all still the same. The predictions were completely wrong. We didn't reach any point of no return. 2008, the Forum for the Future says, refugees are expected to move to Antarctica because of the rising temperatures that will see the population of the continent increase to 3.5 million people by 2040. I think uh, in many parts of Antarctica, the temperature is something like negative 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And in the nicest, the ni- most temperate parts of Antarctica, it's about 14 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't think anyone is, is moving there, building, building their home to, to set up their family to live in Antarctica. 2009, here we go. This is, this is the stuff you hear. UK Prime Minister Gordon Brown. If we do not reach a deal at this time, let us be in no doubt, once the damage from unchecked emissions growth is done, no retrospective global agreement in some future period can undo that choice. So we should never allow ourselves to lose sight of the catastrophe we face if present warming trends continue. So there it is. 2009, if we don't strike a deal right now, if we don't reverse global warming right now, there is nothing that we can do in the future to reverse it and undo it. Okay, well, we didn't do it. Didn't happen. So it's over, right? So shut up about it. And then 2011, Prince Charles is my favorite one. Prince Charles says that he had calculated that we had just 96 months left to save the world. 96 months is eight years. This was in 2011. That would bring us to 2019, That when the world was over. The world ended in 2019. Nothing to do anymore. That was two years ago. Where are we? Are we, are we in Antarctica? No, we're not. Well, we're still, just, we're still just all throughout the world, and it's all just fine. And they think we're stupid, and we are stupid, because we don't pay attention to this. If you do not pay attention. If you do not notice that they keep shifting the goalposts, if you do not see their transparent fear-mongering for what it is, then you deserve the rule of the regime that that you're currently living under. Remember that they would tell us, Donald Trump, his language is dark and divisive. Dark and divisive. Listen to the way Joe Biden's talking. A cold, horrible death and destruction is coming, but it's not. But it's not. No no more than it, it always is, because this is a fallen world. But if we do not, if we do not see this for what it is, we deserve the government that we have. You know, when you want to preserve your life, at least your digital life, I would strongly recommend you check out LifeLock. People want your data. They want your information. And a lot of the time, they don't want to do very good stuff with that information. They will try to take your identity. Payment apps like Venmo, Cash App, and others make payments really easy but then if you, may, if you don't pay attention to your privacy settings, some of them will share your personal information. A recent report found that payment apps share user data with third parties, such as banks, fraud monitoring services. Some even share it with marketing firms. It's important to understand how cybercrime and identity theft are affecting our lives. Every single day, we put our information at risk on the internet. In an instant, a cybercriminal could harm what's yours, your finances, your credit, 
your good reputation. Good thing there is LifeLock, which detects a wide range of identity theft. Uh, For instance, your social security number for sale on the dark web. You have access to a dedicated restoration specialist if you are a victim. No one can prevent all identity theft or monitor all transactions at all businesses, but you can keep what's yours with LifeLock by Norton. Right now, join, save up to 25% off your first year at lifelock.com slash Knowles. That is lifelock.com slash Knowles for 25% off. Also, as the uh, Covidistan government is is now in place, as we are now ruled through the whims of the public health apparatchiks who who are trying to control every aspect of our life, including making us all take that experimental drug through your employer, maybe you would like to stand with Daily Wire as we say no, as we say no to the Biden mandate, as we say we will not comply. Head on over to dailywire.com slash subscribe. Use code do not comply at checkout for 25% off. We will be right back with a lot more. The question we started this show with is how are people following orders from a guy who seems to be half a vegetable at this point? The answer to that is because the regime makes it seem inevitable. And when I say the regime, when I say the ruling class, or when I say the establishment, I'm talking mostly about Democrats, but a little bit about Republicans too. There's a wonderful guy, Angelo Codevilla, who is a a Claremont scholar. He was a, a foreign policy expert. He had been a a foreign service officer. He had worked in Senate intelligence. Uh, He's really one of the most important minds on the right for understanding our current political moment. He is someone who uh, said that we're living in an oligarchy, that we were living in a republic, but now we're living in an oligarchy. And coincidentally, I, I gave a show yesterday on this very point. And coincidentally, or however you want to see it, very sadly, Angelo Cotevilla was killed yesterday. He was killed in a car accident. And he was 78 years old, but he was still publishing constantly. And he had, had a whole lot more left in him. Uh, but but a- Angelo makes this point, you know, that we're, we're now living under this sort of oligarchic regime. And in that, it's not that the Republicans and Democrats are exactly the same. The Democrats are the senior partners. Okay, they're the ones who formed this regime first by Woodrow Wilson, and then it was implemented by Franklin Roosevelt. But there are Republicans who are the junior partners who want to be part of the regime, who want to be considered intelligent, want to get invited to fancy parties. This is, you know, the people who are the the court conservatives, the the people whose job it is basically just to legitimize the liberal regime by criticizing Republicans at crucial moments. And it's no surprise that one of the outlets that serves this purpose, it's funded by Democrat money, and it is run by disaffected former Republicans who all they want to do now is suck up to, to the liberal regime. It, it's a, a great testament to Angelo Cotevilla that yesterday when he died, the bulwark celebrated his death. That's a, that's a very fine tribute, one of the finest tributes that man could have gotten. The way that they do this, Democrat senior partners, the Republican junior partners, the liberal blob that extends not just in the public sphere, the government, but also in the private sphere, like Google and all the rest of it, is they make their rule seem inevitable. That was always the point, that they understood the science of politics. This was the argument of progressivism. And so they're going to take political power away from the people. They're going to give it to technocratic experts, to to the scientists who understand the science of history and the science of politics and the science of science. And they are going to run our lives for us. So the way that they rule is through a kind of determinism. There's nothing you can do. The tides of history are always going to move in this one direction. That's why we're on the right side of history. They use all of this language. And they don't just do it on the microbes and they don't just do it on the sun monster. They do it on economic matters, for instance, as well. Uh, Chuck Schumer was just uh, just defending his party's last ditch effort to cram in an amnesty for illegal aliens, mass amnesty into their ridiculous three and a half trillion dollar budget bill. And the Senate parliamentarian said, you actually can't do that. So Chuck Schumer started out his diatribe by blasting the Senate parliamentarian. And he explains why the flood of illegal aliens into our country is necessary and inevitable. We're short of workers from one end of America to the other. One of the reasons the Trump administration dramatically cut back on immigrants in this country. We need them. We need them in our labor force. We need them to continue American vitality. We need them because they're part of the American dream. 
It's estimated in my city by some that one-third of the health care workers at the height of COVID who risked their lives for us were immigrants. Having a, a strong law that helps our immigrants is vital. The American people understand that fixing our broken immigration system is a moral imperative and an economic imperative. Immigration reform has been one of the most important causes of my time in the Senate, and I will not stop fighting to achieve it. It is one of the most important causes to Chuck Schumer because he believes that it will give him a permanent majority. So that's why he's trying to give mass amnesty to people who statistically are much more likely to side with Democrats. But do you hear his argument? Beyond the typical, the healthcare workers, they're the, the immigrants are the greatest people in the whole world and they never do anything bad and they only do things that are good and how dare you not give them amnesty, even though the first act they did in our country was break our laws, some of our most basic laws. So what Chuck Schumer does here is beyond the typical political sentimental stuff. He says this is inevitable. It's predetermined. We need it. To we need immigration. We, we even need illegal immigration because that's the only way to keep our economy running. He's saying, look, we have a labor shortage. Now, why do we have a labor? We do kind of have a labor shortage. We have a labor shortage in part because Democrats are paying Americans to stay home. So we have a largely contrived, constructed, intentional labor shortage. But even before COVID, they were still making these arguments before COVID. Why were they making these arguments? They were making these arguments because they would say, look, we need the immigrants to come in to do these jobs because Americans are not having babies. Right? We're, we are not replacing ourselves in this country. The birth rates are plummeting. The only way to keep our economy going is to flood the country with immigrants. So why are Americans not having babies? I'm sure there are a number of reasons, but one of the reasons is child care is very expensive and Americans can no longer support a family on a single income. Why is that the case? Why is it so expensive to have kids? Well, because people aren't making the same kinds of wages that they used to make relative to the rest of the economy. Why aren't they making the same kinds of wages they used to make? Oh, in no small part, because we're flooding the country with immigrants. And when we're not flooding the country with immigrants, or I suppose in tandem with flooding the country with immigrants, we're outsourcing a lot of good jobs. Also to boost up GDP, because we got to boost up GDP, even though the gains are going to go disproportionately to people who are on the side of the regime. And the deplorable, irredeemable working class Americans are going to get absolutely hosed in the, in the ensuing process. Do you see the perversity of this? The illegal immigration is inevitable and necessary because of the situation that we ourselves constructed. But we set up the system to flood the country with the immigrants. It's this feedback cycle. And no one is allowed to say boo about, hey, don't flood the country with a lot of low, low skilled labor that's going to lower American wages. Just don't do it. You have a labor shortage? Bump up wages. How about that? Don't outsource it. But we have, we have to flood the country with cheap labor. You, no, you don't. No, you don't. But the economists tell me we have to. Well, I don't care what the economists say. But the experts, the experts say that we have to. I don't care what the experts say. I care what we the people say. Because I think we still have self-government, don't we? Maybe we don't. We did have self-government before we transformed from a republic increasingly into an oligarchy. But I, I think there's still a little glimmer of hope left. And I don't want to hear a word from, I don't want to hear boo from the experts. And you know what? I don't want you outsourcing our jobs to China either. But Michael, Michael, the experts say that we, there's no way. I actually, I spoke to a conservative some years ago. He said, Michael, which party do you think is going to bring the jobs back from China? said, uh, I don't know. I mean, I guess the Republicans, we said, er, wrong answer. The jobs are not coming back. They can't come back. There's no way they can come back. It's inevitable. It's not inevitable. It's not inevitable. Trump, who, you know, was less effective than we we'd all hoped he would be, he brought some manufacturing jobs back. It's not, it's not inevitable. It's such a, it's such a farce. It's such a, it's such an op to use, in, in honor of Angelo Cotevill, I'll use terms from the Claremont people today. It's an op, it's, it's just a political operation. Just to, look at what AOC is doing right now. You remember AOC wore that dress the other day? But AOC was, was showing up to the Met Gala, the fanciest event of the year, and she shows up with all her fancy friends, $35,000 a ticket, and she wears a dress that says, tax the rich. Ooh, ooh, spicy. 
she's a radical. Ooh, gosh, right? Except she's not. She's a tool of the plutocratic neoliberal oligarchy. <laughs> and she's sort of, she's one of their little jesters on the left. And then they've got their little jesters on the right, like the, you know, the people whose magazines they fund. And, and that's it. And then there's the pretend opposition, but they continue to rule. So AOC is taking one step further. She is now, she's now created a line of tax the rich products. <laughs> she's now selling tax the rich merch on her website. You can get a sweatshirt for the low, low proletarian price of $58. You can get a t-shirt for the, uh, the really reasonable $27 for a t-shirt. You can get a dad hat. I don't know what that is for $28. I'm a, I'm a dad, so I probably own some. You can get a sticker pack. Oh, stickers are only $10. A mug for $27 and a tote bag for $27. This is outrageous. If we're going to tax, if we're going to go eat the rich, let's start with the, the AOC campaign merch fund. But it's all just, it, it highlights in particular what a farce the whole thing is. Yeah, stick it to the man. Yeah, tax the rich by giving me $58 for a sweatshirt. Yeah, that'll show them. Yeah, yeah. look, I, look, when I went to the fancy party with all my extremely rich friends, masters of the universe oligarchs, yeah, I wore a dress that that kind of, you know, it's, it was subversive, wasn't it? And that's why they all celebrated me for it and put me in magazines because of how subversive it was. And it's so subversive, I'm going to sell it for 58 bucks. Is there a way to fight back? I don't want to just leave us on this really down negative note. I, cause I, I, cause I'm not a determinist either. I think that there actually is still a way to fight back though. Like Joe Biden with the sun monster, I do think time is running out. I don't, I don't think there's a point of no return, but I think there's a point at which we might have to suffer through a thousand years of darkness before we can, <laughs> you know, get, start to fight back again. I, I don't think we're there yet either. So how do we fight back? Ron DeSantis in Florida is actually showing away. Ron DeSantis is showing away by playing politics the way that politics actually exists. Not the way that we pretend it exists in civics class, but the way it actually exists. He, he's doing it through one of his appointments, through a public health appointment, through the new Surgeon General of Florida. I'm pleased to be able to be with you all today to announce that uh, Dr. Joseph Latipo will be Surgeon General for the state of Florida. Uh, Dr. Latipo comes with us by way of the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. He graduated from Wake Forest and received his medical degree from Harvard Medical School and his PhD in health policy from Harvard Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. And his medical board certifications include internal medicine, American Board of Internal Medicine in 2011. He comes to Florida with really a uh, superb background, uh, bringing superb intellect, um, but also I think will bring uh, great leadership. Okay, so this is a little strange for Ron DeSantis to be going through this litany of all the credentials, all of the specifically sort of liberal regime credentials, right? The Ivy League school and Harvard Medical and this. So why is he doing, is he doing it because he believes these things are, are really markers of, of one's greatness and virtue? No, Republicans, especially DeSantis, usually kind of play down all that stuff. You know, yeah, okay, I went to whatever, I went to Harvard, I went to Yale, but you know, what does that mean these days? There are a bunch of crazy degenerates who don't know anything who go to those places. The reason he's doing it, you can, you can sense it. You can, I'm getting giddy, I'm getting butterflies just listening to DeSantis make this introduction is because you know, if he's going to open up with this big defense of, look, he's got all the smart credentials, you know this guy is going to be an absolute wrecking ball for the conservatives. And he does not disappoint. I talked to the governor, and there are a few things that we're going to keep in mind as we approach public health here in the state of Florida. Florida will completely reject fear as a way of making policies in, uh, in public health. So we're done with fear. We're going to be very explicit about the differences between the science and our opinions. And this idea that, you know, people don't get to make their own decisions, you know, on issues of health related to their own, their own personal health is, um, is, 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 is wrong. And it's, um, and it's not something that we're going to be about. There are good reasons to reject lockdowns. After lockdowns, overall mortality increase. Lockdowns are bad. We need to respect human rights that, you know, people do have autonomy over their lives and it's not okay to, it's not even not okay, but it's not, it's not virtuous and it's not right to just sort of take away those rights from individuals. Vaccines are up to the person. 
There's nothing special about them compared to any other preventive, pre preventive uh, measure. The state should be promoting good health, and vaccination isn't the only path to that. It's been treated almost like a religion. Yes, yes, oh man, I know that everyone's talking about DeSantis for president. Let's run that guy for president. Let's run them both, let's run them both on a ticket. Oh my gosh, I love this guy. I knew, I knew it when DeSantis was saying, and look, before he starts talking, just he went to Harvard. <laughs> he went to your school libs. He went to Harvard Medical, actually, which is even more impressive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh, he was at, what, he was at UCLA or something? Yeah, that's another one of your schools. <laughs> All right, buddy, what do you have to say? Masks are stupid. Vaccines are stupid. The vaccine mandates and the mask mandates are especially stupid. People have control over their lives. Don't live in fear. Focus on virtue. Ha, ha, ha. That's what he said. I mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm, love it. I totally love it. It's... This is what you need to hear. Because by the way, when he's saying, he's not quite saying vaccines are stupid, but he's making a very important point. He's saying, yeah, vaccines are fine, but they're just one measure. They're just one measure. There are other, what about therapeutics? Think about this with AIDS. For, for years and years, decades and decades, under the guidance of Dr. Fauci, actually, the federal government tried to find a vaccine for AIDS. It never happened. They never found one. But people with AIDS can live a very long time now because of therapeutics, because of drugs. Why? They did the same sort of focus here in coronavirus. Put all the money behind a vaccine. Don't focus on any treatments. If anyone does take a treatment, say that they're eating horse paste or something. And this guy comes out, an appointed figure, and says, yeah, the lockdowns actually were bad. The insane focus on these little measures are bad. We're not going to do it. We're not going to live in fear. I know that YouTube or all these other places are going to try to take me down for that. I'm quoting the science. I'm just playing you the science. And a, a man who says there's a big difference between science and our political opinions. On Monday, 500 women, including U.S. soccer player Megan Rapino and lots of other professional athletes, called on the Supreme Court to strike down the Mississippi law that prevents babies from being killed by abortion. Why is this news? Why do I care what Megan Rapino thinks about anything? I certainly don't. Why does the Supreme Court care what Me Megan Rapino thinks about anything? They certainly should not. The reason they're fi filing this brief for the court is they just want to gin up public opinion to pressure the court to strike down a law that protects all these babies from being killed. This, this is a Supreme Court case that very possibly could overturn Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood v. Casey, which was the case that affirmed Roe versus Wade. The, the only reason this story struck me in any way as newsworthy is I thought it was kind of weird that Megan Rapino would be so concerned about abortion. Because last time I checked, Megan Rapino was very famously uh, not interested in men. I don't, I don't think there is any occasion on which Megan Rapino would require or desire or have any relationship to an abortion. Nobody ever requires an abortion. Least of all, Megan Rapino. So why? Why is one of the most famous lesbians in the country so ginned up about abortion, an issue that has absolutely nothing to do with her? I think it gets to this, this issue that is really at the heart of leftism, but really at the heart of liberalism, and actually kind of at the heart of some libertarianism too, this radical individualism that that what the left and the right have been doing since the 1960s, since the kind of cultural revolutions of the 1960s, but you saw the seeds of this going back hundreds and hundreds of years, is prioritizing the individual above all else. That, that the, the defining feature of all of modernity is emancipation. Emancipation from kings. Emancipation from your home country emancipation from social mores, emancipation from the family, emancipation even from yourself, emancipation even if I'm a man, I want to be emancipated and seem like a woman, that I can now do that. Emancipation from the natural bonds of motherhood. If I don't want to be a mother, but I am a mother, I'll just kill the baby. And that's, the, that's part of the emancipation. That's my right. It, it all goes in together. I know some people seem to think that, uh, you know, Feminism is going to undermine transgenderism or, or the LGBT movement. But it's, it's all kind of the same. It all gets down to this fundamental emancipation from, from any sort of natural 
bounds, any sort of natural distinctions, which is why I was really shocked. I shouldn't have been shocked though, to see that this is infecting every element of society, including even Catholics. You know, the, the Catholics should be the holdout here because the Catholics just never really went along with all that kind of modern individualism, liberalism. They just kind of rejected that. They're pretty, pretty old school about these things. And yet I saw this article the other day, a postmodern Catholic divinity student lets go for a moment of grace. And this, this student was describing how he, he wanted to visit a Hindu temple. So he wanted to go visit a Hindu temple ceremony for an assignment in his uh, graduate seminar. And uh, so he, he didn't end up doing that because he was afraid of coronavirus. So he just did it online, which makes the story even funnier. But he's there and he's sort of digitally participating in this. And uh, then he's watching it and kind of taking notes. But he said, no, I shouldn't just watch it. I should participate in this as well. I'm doing this wrong. I'm observing. But I'm, I'm not part of the puja. I'm not, I'm not, I'm distancing myself. So he paused the video, takes a deep breath, exhales, then he stares into Ganesha's eyes and something wonderful happens. I'm entranced, mesmerized. Ganesha's eyes seem to stare back as the chanting wafts over me. I slide into its rhythm. One voice, just breathing, just being, the chanting, the distance of bells. As the puja ends, I'm still staring into Ganesha's eyes. The eyes of Ganesha are all that exists, all that there is in my world. What happened? A moment of grace even though I was in a non-Christian setting. I, I, I must find a deeper answer that goes beyond imposing Christian theology and values on a Hindu puja. In other words, he's uh, worshiping pagan idols to own the traditionalists, to own the conservatives, to own the people who don't believe you should emancipate yourself from everything. You, you actually hear this argument sometimes. You'll hear people say, look, I'm going to violate some well-established tenet of Christianity, whether it's on, I don't know, theology of the body, you know, sex issues, or whether it's on liturgical issues, or whether it's on, uh, you know, Christological issues or whatever. I'm going to violate some, some important doctrine of Christianity because that's really the most Christian thing I could do. The most Christian thing I could do would be to worship pagan idols because it's so open-minded. It's not. It's not. And there's nothing there's nothing new about this, that people think this is some new revelation. No, worshiping pagan idols is the default for humanity. Okay, that's what everyone did for all of human history everywhere until the ancient Israelites and then until that idea of worshiping one God finds its culmination, its fulfillment in Christianity. And now we're going back to that. There is nothing new under the sun, folks, I assure you. The worship of pagan idols is, is not new. This actually, there was an, another article, good article on Unheard, How Satanism Conquered America, just observing that Satanism is just untrammeled individualism. Do whatever you want. Ye shall be as gods. That's what the serpent says to Eve in the Garden of Eden. That's how, how John Milton kind of views Satanism too. And so when we just do whatever we want at any given time, that, there is really no distinction here. And that's why these sorts of things have uh, darker uh, symbols associated with them. There's nothing new under the sun. We look at our new government. Oh, we have the enlightenment, brilliant, genius, scientific rule of the experts. No, it's just oligarchy. It's just, there have been a lot of oligarchies in history, and we're descending into one now as well. And, and you know, I, I mentioned Angelo Cotavilla earlier. We've just lost one of the great, the, one of the great minds on this issue. So uh, let's not forget about him. Let's not memory hold that. Let's recognize. Let's see this moment clearly for what it is. Let's not get lost in Ganesha's eyes or whatever. Let's not get lost in Dr. Fauci's eyes either. Let's see this for what it is. Let's decide what kind of society we want to live in, what government we want to live under, and let's exercise our political authority such as we still have it to do so. I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. I'll see you tomorrow. The Michael Knowles Show is produced by Ben Davies. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Our technical director is Austin Stevens. Supervising producer, Mathis Glover. Production manager, Pavel Vidovsky. Editor and associate producer, Danny D'Amico. Associate producer, Justine Turley. Audio mixer, Mike Coromina. And hair and makeup by Cherokee Hart. The Michael Knowles Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2021. On The Matt Wall Show, we talk about the things that matter. Real issues that affect you, your family, our country. Not just politics, but culture, faith, current events, all the fundamentals. If they matter to you, 
come check out the show.